Again, thank you so much everyone for joining us today. My name is Ivona Alfred and I'll be your host today. First and foremost, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that you continue to stay safe and evolve personally and professionally in these very hard recovery times. We're so happy to share with you today. Um, so I have quick housekeeping notes. Today's webinar recording and PowerPoint will be available online within just a few days. Please use the Q&A button on, on the bottom of your um, Zoom screen to submit questions for the panelists. And you may also use the chat box for comments and insights, but keep the Q&A only for questions to the panelists. So to kick this off, I wanted to introduce our three presenters from ITDP. Um, we have Dana Yanoga, who is the sen Senior Research um, Associate at the Global Office, who is the main author of the Taming Traffic Report. And we also have Daniele Hope, a Project Manager for the Active Transportation and Demand Management Projects from ITD Brazil Office. And then finally, we have Penina Ngewa, a Transport Planning Associate from the ITDB Africa Office based in Nairobi, Kenya. The presenters will discuss traffic reducing strategies focusing on low cost, high impact measures with examples from ITDP regions. So without further delay, I'll now ask Dana to take it away for us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ivana. Okay, I'm going to... Great, okay. Um... So I'm going to go ahead and start uh, the, the webinar off today by just giving some context and framing to the discussion, which, as Ivana mentioned, will focus on reducing private vehicle use and promoting sustainable modes like walking, cycling, and public transit. I'll also introduce a couple of concepts from a new ITDP report uh, titled Taming Traffic. So traffic reduction and management has been uh, a big challenge for a number of cities, especially when we think about recent decades where we saw rising car ownership trends and also longstanding cultural aspirations to own a car, um, you know, persisting in, in most regions. And there are a number of different motivations for pursuing traffic reduction. The primary motivation is often poor local air quality. Uh, we know that air pollution impacts nine out of 10 people in cities. It advances lung diseases, especially among susceptible populations like children and the elderly. And other conditions like asthma, lung cancer, uh, these are made worse by exposure to air pollutants like particulate matter and ozone. So cities are obviously concerned about this public health crisis particularly in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, which really shined a light on how people exposed to air pollution have a much higher risk of severe illness and death when facing respiratory diseases. Cities are also committing to, or perhaps have already committed to lowering their private vehicle mode shares, and on the flip side, expanding mode shares for public transport, walking and cycling. And lastly, traffic management can be an opportunity for revenue generation. So thinking about strategies like congestion pricing, parking pricing, even emission space pricing, these can generate revenue beyond what's actually needed to operate those programs. And this can be an opportunity for cities to be able to pay for improvements and maintenance to alternatives to driving like footpaths, cycle lanes, and dedicated transit lanes. So we know that most cities want to do something about congestion. They want to address this um, issue of worsening local air quality. And at the same time, we know that there isn't enough space in cities for every person to own and operate a vehicle, regardless of whether that vehicle is fossil fuel or electric powered. Unfortunately, though, we still often see cities trying to address traffic congestion by building more roads or expanding existing roads. This may ease congestion in the short term, but we know that eventually congestion will return. And it's really communities that are the ones that are left with um, all of these negative effects and external costs of driving. So, you know, it's, it's environmental costs 
when we think about emissions and even noise pollution, there's also societal costs um, that, that need to be addressed in terms of you know, road safety, uh, and even thinking about the division of community and social fabric that we see um, with the construction of, of new or, or widening roads. And it ends up being communities and individuals that, that shoulder these costs regardless of whether they drive or not. Fortunately, though, there are many, many options to control car use and limit the negative effects of car traffic. We often refer to these as push or pull measures, or sometimes carrots and sticks. Push measures disincentivize driving by more accurately reflecting its true cost. So things like parking pricing, congestion pricing, and then pull measures incentivize people to use other modes aside from driving. So thinking about improving the quality of cycling infrastructure, making public transit cheaper and faster, or even thinking about shifting people away from traveling at peak times or avoiding certain trips altogether. So thinking about all of these options, the question comes to mind of what should cities actually do to reduce traffic and make sure that they're addressing all of the negative externalities of driving. So ITDP recently released a report where we evaluate different traffic reduction strategies and we consider how cities with limited capacities in particular might successfully implement these measures. And we found that starting with these low cost, high impact interventions that focus on people like pedestrian priority streets, complete streets, uh, transit malls, these really make walking, cycling and taking transit faster and more convenient than driving. And they can really help to start shift trips towards those more sustainable modes. And then once a little more capacity and public support is in place, uh, the cities can think about pricing and managing parking, which can really continue the momentum away from driving and also start to generate revenue that can be used to fund improvements to sustainable transport infrastructure. And then as a final step, starting to think about implementing zones that actually restrict vehicle access. And that of course requires the most robust amount of capacity. I think it's really important to note while we're thinking about these strategies and implementing them as sort of this progression, um, that all of these strategies actually can coexist together and make the others stronger when operating all at the same time. In the Taming Traffic Report, we evaluate different traffic reduction strategies, and we consider these sort of three areas um, for, for how successful these strategies can be. Um, so the first is considering uh, the, the strategy's ability to actually reduce demand for driving, right? This is, this is what we're, we're trying to do. We're trying to reduce particularly single occupancy, high polluting vehicle trips during peak times. So is the strategy successful in doing that? And is the strategy able to link to existing citywide goals that are sort of connected to this idea of traffic reduction? So things like reducing vehicle kilometers traveled and uh, shifting more trips to sustainable modes. The second thing we looked at is if these strategies are able to advance or contribute to sustainable transport goals. So looking at their ability to improve access, protect the environment, um, use resources efficiently, et cetera. And then lastly, we consider uh, the, the capacity needs to implement um, and operate these strategies. So um, potential privacy concerns, uh, different aspects of political complexity that might be at play um, and political will that might be needed to adopt these strategies, and also considering um, technological and capital needs. So we came up with four key takeaways that really underscore the idea of implementing traffic reduction strategies as part of a package and focusing on providing sustainable alternatives to driving. So the webinar today is going to focus on this second takeaway, which is really how reallocating road space from vehicles to people helps generate momentum towards reducing private vehicle use. 
The Taming Traffic Report is available uh, on ITDP's website. You can go to itdp.org backslash taming traffic. Uh, the full report is there. We also have an executive summary uh, and you can download the infographic from that link as well. And then I just wanted to um, remind everyone that this is actually the first uh, webinar in a series that ITDP is putting together around this idea of taming traffic. Uh, so this first webinar focusing on road space reallocation. The next one in the series will focus more on parking reform and its impacts on traffic reduction. And then finally, uh, looking at those zone-based vehicle access restrictions like low emission zones and congestion pricing. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Daniele. Hello, everyone. I'll just share my screen with you guys. Can you see it? Is yes, it working? Yes. yes. Okay. So thanks, Dana. Let me just move this, my video here. <laughs> Sorry. Well, thank you, Dana, and well, hello everyone. I'll be, I'll be sharing with you some ideas and experiences in reallocating road space for people in Brazilian cities. Oh, if the computer allows me. <laughs> uh, just to give a bit of context, in general, in Brazilian cities, pedestrians account for 39% of total daily trips, while cars account for about 26%. But despite of that, we tend to let cars occupy at least 70% of the space available in, our, in our, our streets. And we are also the fourth country in the world in traffic fatalities. About 30,000 people die on our roads and streets every year. That's a, it's like a small town disappearing every year. And about 17% of the people who die are pedestrians. And we can say that there is already a certain level of awareness on the fact that we need a more sustainable urban mobility system. And that this means that we will have to reduce car use. Well, but when this change touch the ground and start to take out space from cars to implement wider sidewalks, cycling lanes or bus corridors, we still face a lot of resistance from both governments and the population. And on the other hand, we have evidence that a better distribution of road space is part of this set of measures that can help our cities become more livable and more sustainable for everyone, right? So how do we get there, right? How, how do we manage to reallocate road space for people? Our final goal is making walking, cycling, and, and transit faster, safer, and more convenient than driving. And for that, in the best scenario, you have political will combined with planning and implementation capacity. But we know that, well, at least in Brazil, real life tends to show you a different scenario most of the time. We are normally, we are normally get none of these features or maybe one at a time. You have political will, but you don't have planning or implementation capacity, or you have planning capacity and lack of political will and so on. So in this case, we need to find strategies to push for a more equitable distribution of road space, and that will lead to a better quality of life for everyone, right? I've listed here a few strategies that we've been seeing or applied in Brazilian cities over the past few years, and I'll show you some examples. Of course, this is not a, an extensive or academic review of road space reallocation strategies, it's just a couple of thoughts that I would like to share with you. First, seize opportunities is one of them. Especially if you are a public servant, take advantage of existing initiatives and try to influence them. Advocate or build local government support. Here you can be a community member, a grassroots organization, or an organization that provides technical support to local government, like IDDP. And you can use data collection to demonstrate or either demand or the impact of the initiatives. And the third strategy is raising awareness. It's not not sure if it's, that's really a, a strategy, but most of the people don't really know or don't really realize how serious the, the negative impacts of our car-centric cities can be to their own lives. And then you, they also don't imagine how our streets ca can look if, if it's fought for people. They've learned to, to see and they, they were raised in, a, in cities where streets were planned for cars only, right? So raising awareness, I think it's also an important uh, an important strategy if you really want to reallocate uh, road space for people. 
And for all these strategies, wait, sorry, this is not. For all these strategies, we found that tactical urbanism or other type of temporary interventions can be useful tools. And why is tactical urbanism a good tool to break this resistance? Because it makes streets transformation more tangible. Once you've tested the new street design with low cost materials, you can collect data, you can analyze its impact and have more sound discussions with city staff and with the community. And even if sometimes they are not permanently implemented, we notice that the people who were engaged during the process, they don't forget that experience. They will bring it up in later discussions. And even, even if not implemented, they can inspire other initiatives. So we definitely see this intervention as short-term actions that promote long-term change. And so uh, starting with the strategies, what do I mean by seizing opportunities? Although I find it very uneasy to call the pandemic an opportunity, I could not find a better word, okay? And as we've seen in several cities around the world, in Belo Horizonte, a state cap capital with about 3 million inhabitants, they took advantage of the traffic reduction during quarantine to implement about 30 kilometers of, of cycling lanes and improve connections of the existing network. They started by painting just a white stripe and pavement markings, and also placing cones along the way, as you can see on the pictures. And in the most risky areas, they had police or traffic officers to help with speed reduction in the beginning. So the first step was to take advantage of the political moment and quickly occupy the, the road space with a different use. And then they started to work to improve the quality of the, the infrastructure, adding cat eye reflectors, for example, and improving intersections. Of course, there's a lot to improve in terms of infrastructure quality. But that was a big step for the Belo Horizonte. It's a city that has debated and planned, and planned cycling infrastructure along the years, but lacks implementation. And here you have another example, Campo Grande, which is another state capital. With the, the Campo Grande has less than a million uh, inhabitants. And they are currently revitalizing the downtown area in a multi-year initiative with IDB support and involvement of several organizations. And IDB selected Campo Grande as one of the three cities in Latin America to test tactical urbanism approach to prepare the cities to their reopening, creating outdoor public spaces and, and open areas for bars and restaurants to serve their clients. The broader the broader consulting organization, TransLab, would be to design and to guide the city in the implementation process. So they tested the redesigned public space for a month, about uh, around the, the end of last year. And they have now removed everything and are working on the permanent implement implementation project, which is expected to take part, uh, to take place in the coming months. And finally, I wanted to mention the transformation of Rio Branco Avenue in Rio. Before the Olympics in 2016, downtown Rio was undergoing several transformations. Rio Branco Avenue was receiving a light braille and the avenues closed for cars had been already considered in previous urban redesign proposals but it had always been left aside to the, to the high political costs right as we as we all know so this is the, the how the avenue looked like before uh, 2014 and in 2015 due to the construction of the, the light rail tracks the other two lanes were used for bus only cars were redirected to other routes but the idea was to open the the the, the avenue to cars again once construction was done so they were about to miss a great opportunity. Drivers were already uh, used to avoid downtown area by, by that, that time. So at that time, uh, um, at that time, my TDP was collaborating with the Bloomberg Associates in road safety initiatives in Rio. And the idea of opening the two remaining lanes for people was reactivated as per their suggestions. And, and having this support, the mayor approved the Rio Branco Avenue was going to be partially closed for cars. And nowadays, it's it has a stretch, it's not a full avenue, it's a stretch of uh, about 600 meters that is closed for cars. So it's, it's a big change because of the, they, they decided to seize an opportunity, right? The, this is not a tactical urbanism initiative, but it's kind of a, transporting, a temporary use of the street that led to, to a better result at the end. And building local government support I'll, here I'll show you some of the, our tactical urbanism in, 
uh, initiatives. In 2016, we, we joined in a large initiative to promote uh, traffic calming cal measures at low speed zones in Sao Paulo in partnership with several other organizations. And after a previous, organized, uh, previous pop up organized in 2016, they had not been implemented. In 2017, we got in touch with the city, invited them to identify another priority neighborhood and to collaborate with us in the design and implementation of a second pop up intervention. But this time, with a more coordinated approach, and that could lead to permanent implementation. We worked on three, two intersections in Santana neighborhood, as you can see on the image. We hosted community engagement meetings and information sessions. And we had a one day pop up, as you can see here and here. And we also collect data before and during the pop ups. We also published a report describing the, the full pop up implementation process. This report is available online. And later on, we heard that uh, from city staff that the, the report was very important for them to replicate the methodology in other regions of the city. So the, the city implemented one of the intersections about eight months after the pop-up. And they fine-tuned the, the geometry and implemented it with paint and bollards, as you can see on the picture on the right. And around the same time, they also took the leadership and invited us to conduct another pop-up intervention at a low-income zone which was also got implemented with paint and bollards. So from the Pushy pedestrian road and road safety advocate, we became partners who could help to guide them uh, through this new methodology of work. And we consider that an important change of perspective, right? And last year, they finally implemented the second uh, intersection, now with capital construction. They waited for a larger intervention to uh, program to include it. And the final example I would like to show is how tactical urban initiatives can raise public awareness and incite change. We are back to Belo Horizonte, one year before the pandemic. We hosted a three-day pop-up intervention in partnership with the city and, and her small with the um, sorry with the active mobility department of the city and her small team. And the active mobility team in Belo Horizonte had been trying to advance the implementation of third, uh, third speed zones since 2014 in partnership with several local and international organizations, but had always faced a lot of resistance from the public opinion and, and city officers. Sorry. Sorry, because there is a chat here coming in. Oh. Sorry about that. The pop-up innovation in 2019 was the first one in Belo Horizonte, at least of this size, right? And we, we got a good media coverage, especially as we were working outside of the central area, which tends not to be very attractive to the media, right? So the permanent implementation happened right away. They've never removed the, ge the, the geometry. But on the, other, on the other hand, construction was very simple. And I believe that's our next step in Brazil. We need to start giving more attention to the quality of our public space. But the most important, the, the new design that forced cars to reduce speed is there, as well as other small improvements, such as the installation of a bus a shelter. And as the pop-up got attention from, from the media in that same year, the city received requests to implement other 10 similar initiatives in, the, in requests from, the, from citizens, right? They, all wanted third zones implemented in their neighborhoods. So two of them were implemented, and that's one of them that's around the school. And finally, they have just implemented this chicane in the central area of Belo Horizonte. It's a small stretch, but it's a big win. And, and this, is, this is the area where they historically had a lot of resistance and any kind of road space, uh, of any kind of road space reallocation, both from traffic engineers and the population. So it's been a long process, but it seems that the public opinion is finally understanding the value the value of such change. So to finalize, I guess the main message I want to bring here is that small interventions can be the seed to bigger changes. And, and we need this scale of planning in our cities. Reallocating road space is, is a one-to-one -one initiative. We are touching people's everyday life. And we are challenging the public space concept. They've been told it's right. So, so we, are, we are also aware that the, 
they can still very, take very long to, to get implemented, at least in the Brazilian reality. And we do need a much faster uh, pace of change if we want to improve entire neighborhoods and not only one or two intersections. But on the other hand, we also recognize and understand that changing this mindset takes time. And we believe that this kind of intervention can help break the, this resistance. So thank you. I hope I didn't speak too much, but thanks. Thank you, Daniele. You may, uh, great. So I, I'll invite Penina to share her screen. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Yvonne, and thank you, everybody um, participating in this webinar. Just a second. On the bottom, you can. Yes. Great. Uh, oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, um, maybe you yeah. can try to exit. Oh, great. Perfect. Right. Yes. So I'll be, I'm Penny Nandagwa. I'm from Nairobi, Kenya, uh, ITDP Africa. And uh, I'll just be taking you through some of the initiatives uh, on taming traffic around Africa region. And why I shared this map is just to show you some of the areas where we work in Africa, uh, some of the cities. We work in Cairo, we work in Addis Ababa, we work in Nairobi, Dar es Salaam, Kisumu, Mombasa, Kigali, Kampala, and many other cities to come. So basically starting with how people travel, um, starting with Kenya, which is similar across all the cities. As you can see from the charts, uh, majority of the people walk uh, uh, from, um, that is over 40% of the people walk or use public transport. But then when it comes to infrastructure provision, it does not match up. You will see very well provision for the motorized traffic, uh, very good carriageways, very good um, uh, highways, but then when it comes to NMT improve uh, provision that is working in cycling infrastructure, it is not uh, well catered at all. So you'll see a lot of pedestrians walking on the road, exposing them to accidents, and you'll see some of the some places where they've started uh, improving some of the walking facilities. But then you'll see the designs are in a big mess, uh, as you can see some of the poles that are erected on the footpaths. Some of the drainage are open. You'll get some barricades uh, and all the debris on the, you know, thrown on the side of the footpaths. And this basically make walking very unfriendly for most people uh, in Nairobi across African cities. And most of the time, as Dana mentioned uh, in her presentation, most of the times uh, governments uh, or even some policy makers always think that by expanding the roads, we are going to solve the traffic congestion. This is Dika Road uh, in, a, in Nairobi. And so initially it used to be dual carriageway. And then uh, around 2013, uh, 2010, between 2010 to 2013, there was this road that was constructed, which is Dika Superhighway. And as you can see, there are four, some section even has have five lanes. And right now, the traffic congestion is even worse than it was before. So when you expand roads, um, it just induces more cars. It attracts more vehicles. Because what happened, development uh, spread across uh, along the road. And now we have a lot of people commuting, uh, getting to Nairobi CBD. So basically, this does not work. And so basically, we've just been given so much priority to the car. And this is what we are talking about today. We need to uh, reduce how much space we allocate to the car and use that space to, um, to provide for other modes of transport that is walking, cycling and public transport. And that's something that Dar es Salaam has done in Tanzania. And again, using the same right of way, they're able to provide for uh, an NMT that is walking, cycling and public transport. And then what was left was left for the uh, private cars. And this is what we need to adopt in other cities. Going to Kisumu city, um, they are now working on improving uh, working facilities across the city. And this initiative, of, uh, our, we call it the um, Kisumu Triangle Project, which is by the time it is being completed, we are going to see Kisumu City being workable. As you can see, the pedestrian realm is very uh, wide. 
uh, we have the trees were maintained, they have sitting places, it just make it attractive for pedestrians to walk any time uh, of the day. And uh, of course, even thinking about safety around school zone so that our school uh, ch children are safe when they are going to school because we've seen that despite the number of pedestrians that actually experience accidents, students are uh, more vulnerable and need to ensure that they can access their schools safely and conveniently. And most importantly, is actually to provide safe pedestrian crossings. And uh, for us, we advocate for this type of um, crossing. We call it tabletop crossing. It's elevated, as you can see, and it actually serves as a traffic calming aspect element. So that way, the vehicles are able to slow down and pedestrians are able to cross conveniently. And again, because it is raised the level of footpaths, then even somebody using a wheelchair can conveniently cross the other side of the road. And going now to the cycling, uh, again, like uh, walking, they're not well catered for. And because of that uh, lack of um, cycle track across the city, cycling become a very uh, insignificant, allow me to use that word, or rather an attractive mode of transport among the residents. And because you don't want to risk your life uh, competing with, uh, with the motorized traffic. So, but then we've seen some change over the past few years. We've started seeing uh, cities starting to implement uh, cycling infrastructure that are continuous, that are connected. That way you are able now to commute from your office to home comfortably in, uh, in your bike. But again, this need to continue. It's not, um, it's not, we have a long way to go, but at least we, we have some good examples in Nairobi and across other cities in Africa, and we're hoping that this trend is going to continue. And most importantly, even now having cycling as a mode of, uh, as a part of public transport system by introducing bike share systems. So uh, uh, several cities are in the process of planning bike share systems, starting with Kigali, we in Dar es Addis Ababa, and Nairobi has some tentative uh, plan in the pipeline just, coming up with bike share solutions that are going to help cities become more cycle friendly uh, and uh, you know, access cycle easily for them to navigate across the city. And now going back to public transport systems, as you can see, um, it's characterized by inefficiency. You have to wait uh, for the next bus that is going to come. We don't know when it's going to come. Uh, there's sometimes the route changes uh, depending on the weather, depending on the time, the fare changes. And uh, it's just a very informal sector, uh, again, being operated by private sector because the government has not done enough in providing public transport services. However, some cities are now taking it up, starting with Dar es Salaam, uh, providing efficient public transport system for its citizens and by introducing BRT systems. And this is something that is happening across the world. I mean, across Africa, uh, in start, including Nairobi. Uh, this is again, Thika Road. Uh, we're now uh, working towards implementing uh, the Nairobi BRT system. And we hope by the time it's done, a lot of people are going to be moved more efficiently and most importantly, uh, safer, conveniently, and even reduce uh, the use of private cars. Uh, again, this is Kisumu City, uh, a city that we've been working on uh, for years. And similarly, we're also working on ensuring that we, we improve the public transport system. And uh, we hope by the time they also implement uh, their public transport system, they're going to have it uh, an efficient uh, transport system for its citizen. And uh, going back to the aspect of parking, because we need to limit uh, the amount of parking spaces allocated to the private vehicles on street and even off street. But for today, I want to talk about off street parking because the more you provide, the more the demand. It's just like expanding roads. The more roads you provide, the more the traffic. And similar to parking, it's the principles of induced demand. So we need to curb uh, or we need to reduce the parking supply in our street so that we can curb, um, we can be able to curb uh, demand for parking. And this is Morogoro Road in Dar es Salaam again. And what happened, it used to be, this is how it used to be before. And this space was actually reclaimed to provide a to, it was open to the people for pedestrian and as a public transport system. This street is not open for private cars. That way now people are able to walk comfy, uh, comfortably as well as access their facilities using public transport. Uh, this again is Nairobi. Um, 
initially this all this space used to be parking where you can see i think you can tell the diff by the difference of paper blocks uh, all these spaces used to be parking spaces and now they have changed um over time uh, it was actually reclaimed for pedestrians and um, it's now more friendly for pedestrians to walk and it's reduced the number of parking spaces available and actually this is one of the most expensive street to rent a commercial space because there's always high pedestrian volume and uh, that's how um just to show you that taming reducing the vehicles in traffic can even be good for for your businesses because more people are on foot and basically we just need to change the status quo if we build more vehicle we more if we plan our cities for the cars what we'll get is traffic just like dana said traffic congestion air pollution accidents but we need to change that to make sure that we provide uh, with design cities for people and that's by providing uh walking cycling and public transport priority and of course going even to the land use ensuring that we have high density and mixed use development to bring more people near public transport systems so that more people don't have to keep you know traveling a lot to work and that's the end of my presentation and i'm happy to hear from you thank you great thank you so much penina and thank you all presenters for your um presentations and insights that you've shared. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that the Q&A function is open to add your questions. Um, and I'm just going to pick up a question. Uh, actually, it's the first question uh, from Razon. It's about land scarcity. Um, so as we know, building uh, roads and wider roads is not a good solution as it only in induces traffic. And then of course it tur turns into creating more damage for people. Um, so what about the places that have issues with land scarcity to begin with, uh, with poorly developed road networks, uh, with no NMT infrastructure whatsoever? Um, so maybe this is a question for either Penina or Danieli. Either of you can feel free to pick that one up. OK, uh, I can start. Um, when it comes, first of all, I, land is always it's a scarce entity we are not going to expand our world in fact it's going to reduce over time if we don't take care of it and for that reason we need to start thinking of what we can do with the space that we have so for the streets that um the right of way for example if the right of way allows then we can be able to provide for nmt for i know like in kenya we've uh itdp africa we've come up with a street design manual whereby we give standards on how depending on this amount of street right of way that you have then you can be able to design and provide for nmt that is working and cycling and when it is not possible then you provide a shared space you know and when it is shared space then you have to ensure that the traffic uh, traffic aspect comes in so that you can enhance the safety of pedestrian uh, you have to ensure that um, there's the, uh, the speed limits are there. We have speed bumps, for example, the safety around school zone. That way we provide people, it can be a shared space where it's safe for pedestrian, uh, motorists and cyclists to use the same space, but at the same time not compromising on their safety. And now for other areas that are maybe urbanizing and initially like we have that uh, characteristic a lot in Kenya, whereby an area used to be like a rural area and they had like very narrow streets, but now it has urbanized to become like a big urban area and there's high density coming up and more people need to access the space. So what the city does, there's always that land readjustment. Like when you're applying for your development approval, then you have to surrender a specific number of meters to uh, to the for the development for the street expansion. But what happens sometimes if you're not careful, we may end up expanding the street, but not uh, ensuring that we provide for NMT. So it has to be very intentional, and cities have to ensure that the moment we uh, we we allow, we surrender some land for street development, then we have to prioritize NMT development. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Penina. Um, I'm going to jump into a question about the role of um, data gathering methods and also bundle um, question about um, the impact of parking reduction on businesses from Fad Fadji here. Um, so the first question in that bundle is, um, Danieli, maybe that's for you. <laughs> you mentioned the role of data in raising awareness and 
demonstrating demand for sustainable transport modes. Um, do you actually have insights about the data collection methods? And what is the, uh, the second part of the question? What is the impact of parking reduction on businesses? Was there any, any analysis done on this? Hello. Well, the, what we do normally in our uh, pop-up interventions is uh, we do p pedestrian count, uh, counts. And also we analyze intersections and conflicts and intersections. And at least, let me think the ones yeah, also uh, will speed, average speed, let me remember. And, and surveys, we also ask people if they feel safe, if they not, to get the user's per, uh, user perspective. And yeah, these are the, the, the whole methodology of data collection, it's, it's on the, the report, although it's in Portuguese, but you can, we can, we can get some, some information if you, if you need more in deep information. Um, more, another resource as far as if you need uh, more in-depth information. But, and regarding the parking spaces, it's always an issue. And we work normally in areas that are close to, um, to public transportation, except in the case of um, Belo Horizonte, the, the pop-up intervention there was pretty far from, from any public transit. There, there's a bus that goes along that street, but, but it's not very frequent. And we, we did have issues with the, the merchants. They, at, at the beginning, they, we removed the whole a full block, now it's half a block of uh, parking space. And in the permanent implementation, we have, to, we have to put it back part of them. So it's always an issue, but at the same time, we have surveys showing that it doesn't really matter depending on specifically if you have a construction material store then it might it might be an issue but but for the other uses you can improve your your clients and you can you, the number of clients the independent of parking space and uh, penina do you would you like to pick up on that on the data yeah, data is very important uh, in any transportation uh, aspect. And uh, when it comes to parking, uh, we have to off-street parking specifically. You, you cannot essentially provide for everybody. I know like uh, in Kenya, we have been having the aspect of uh, max minimum parking requirement whereby for a specific amount of space that you rent out for commercial space, then you are supposed to provide this amount of parking spaces for example it's usually like for Nairobi specifically it's 100 square meters one parking lot and what happens with the minimum parking requirement then there's always the aspect of developers even providing more spaces than necessary and what happens is that you end up uh, having more uh, parking than necessary you know, and you'll find that for most buildings, you'll get the, the first four floors will, will be occupied by, by parking. And what that influences the street because the street becomes less visually active and it becomes less attractive to walk around because there's no interior connection to the building. And, um, you know, it just become unfriendly for pedestrians walking by. So it just, it becomes like a wall and wall of, street not necessary it is no connection between the building and the and the street so for us what you've done in kenya we've been trying to work with the national government in changing some of those policies and we, we are encouraging to change from maximum parking requirement i mean sorry from minimum parking requirement to maximum parking requirement that way you still provide parking but at least you're turning it you're reducing it to a certain amount because we we did a survey specifically in upper hill uh, in nairobi and realize that despite the capping that is given by the government for like i mentioned one hundred square meter to provide one parking the buildings would the all the developers would actually go beyond like they would even provide three times more parking than necessary so if it one building has like a thousand parking lots they have actually built a whole tower on the side of the building uh, maybe you can share a slide later on if there will be time but basically it's it's just crazy and it's just a lot of space that is not necessary to, it's a lot of waste of urban land that need to be used for other uses like affordable housing, providing um, 
you know, commercial spaces that are expensive. And so it's just really thinking about priority. What do we need to do? And most importantly, for going back to the topic of today, at the end of the day, all these cars will go back to our streets and they'll cause congestion. So it's basically uh, not a viable idea. So data is very important to know where you are at the moment, but most importantly is also thinking, how can you ensure that those people are, are going to work using public transport? So ensuring that those regions where were developed as high-end commercial areas, we still ensure that we have public transport system getting there. We have NMT network working and cycling. That way we give people alternatives to get to work, not necessarily prioritizing parking spaces in buildings. Can I can I just comment? Because yes. the the parking issue, like it's uh, it's important to be if you have the chance, conduct surveys and ask ask people where do they come from and how, how did they arrive to that region? You're gonna see that probably at least in the Brazilian reality, most of the people didn't come by car. Thanks so much. Uh, so from that question, let's jump into financing. Um, there were a couple of questions about that. Um, so the first one from Eduardo about how city governments finance the traffic reducing measures. Can you share some insights? So for example, Daniele was focusing on the short-term measures that can turn into permanent and Penina more on the long-term measures. So what is the difference and how this can get financed? And we can start with short or long. <laughs> yeah, well, well, regarding finance, I uh, some examples, people always ask me, some examples of, of possible funding for, for small interventions, right? Fortaleza in Brazil, it's another capital city in Brazil, is using part of their parking revenues to implement cycling infrastructure. And you also have the land value capture and similar mechanism related to, to real estate and to, to, the, to urban development. You can always also create a fund in Sao Paulo, it works like that. So they have a fund that comes from, from this kind of mechanism. And part of this fund is redirected to, to urban development. And that, that includes small, small interventions of uh, sp uh, public space interventions. So you have several, I guess, Dana can, can talk a lot about that. So that's part of the report as well. But you got to be creative. There, there are options. They, they might not take the uh, short, it, it, it might not be for tomorrow or like short term, but, but there are options to explore. Yeah, if I could add on top of what Danielle said, um, I don't think providing uh, NMT is actually expensive because like you've seen in my presentation, they are able to build very good carriages. So why not, you know, do some, you know, allocate some of that percentage to to uh, to NMT or to sustainable transport modes. So basically, it's I mean, it's um, it's just a matter of priority. I think it's a matter of priority. And going into the way like uh, Daniel presented, like use some of those short term measures. Like first of all, applying tactical urbanism before you can make up uh, permanent changes. I think that's something that most African cities need to adopt because sometimes you end up implementing things that are not being used or we'll end up seeing the mistake later on. So we, if we can at least adopt some tactical urbanism before we you know, invest heavily on the permanent uh, measures, then it would save the government a lot of cost. And also thinking of indirect costs. For example, if you provide NMT and uh, public transport, then people are healthier, people are able to walk safely. There's significant reduction uh, of money going to health because people are healthier and uh, you know, it's just the environment is cleaner. And so some of that indirect costs is very important to, to also calculate. And finally, like in terms of like for Nairobi case, thinking of the cost of not doing, sometimes you're always thinking about how much it costs to do to build something, but then we fail to think what is the cost of not building a public transport system? For example, how many billions of dollars are lost every day because of traffic congestion? If that, when you think of the amount that goes to waste because of congestion, and you can resolve that by just providing an efficient public transport system, then to make a business case and also like for the local small businesses thinking about 
the mobile phone foot, the higher the, like I showed you that photo in, uh, in Nairobi CBD where after they reclaimed parking, some parking to expand the pedestrian realm, that commercial space is very expensive for businesses. That means the businesses are more vibrant and they cannot be able to pay more taxes because they can earn more. So thinking around all those uh, economics of uh, investing in sustainable modes of transport is important. Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, I don't know if Dana, you, will, you would like to add anything. Um, otherwise I can jump into another question. Yeah, I'll just quickly add um, that one of the things that we look at in, in the report is, is this idea of sort of starting with these lower cost measures and building public support for the kinds of streets that these measures yield. And I think the, the photos that Daniele and Panina both showed um, you know, the, the improvements in what the, that public space looks like. Um, that's really, uh, you know, effective for people to, to be able to, you know, uh, to, to see that, to, to walk through it, to experience it as part of their daily life. And then, you know, once those, those type of measures are in place in lots of regions of the city, um, then you can start thinking about other options, um, other strategies that do actually generate revenue like parking management or, um, you know, low emission zones, these type of options that you can build up towards and start to generate revenue that you can then cycle back into, um, you know, improving transit, improving cycling infrastructure and sidewalks. Great, thanks so much. Um, so the next category uh, I wanted to touch on is the public buy-in. There's a question uh, from Stephen and from Jack. So Stephen is asking, um, actually, Daniele, do you think the recent improvements in the US public transit, um, such as the subway extended to Barra de Tijuca uh, residential area, um, has improved acceptance of pedestrianizations by the white collar workers um, in Avenida Rio Branco. Um, he's asking because uh, he has um, affluent friends who um, most likely own cars and historically this culture has been resistant to um, accepting that shift um, and accepting uh, sustainable transport modes. And following that, I have a more um, open-ended question for all three of you, um, can you share a little bit more about uh, also public acceptance uh, for the parking measure, parking restrictions and parking minimums, uh, especially for developers? So first I will kick it to uh, Daniele. You're on mute. Regarding the public transit in Rio, I don't really have the data to affirm that, but I have the impression that it did help uh, to, to, to break resistance with the metro and the, and the light rail in downtown area. I think people are using, I, I think, well, at least the light rail in downtown, it's, it, it's not integrated to the system. You have to pay a, an extra fare to use it. So it's by, by it, in a sense, it's already a, a high income transit, right? And so I guess it is essentially focused on this kind of people, the medium class that is avoiding buses for like prejudice. But I don't have the, that's my, my personal impression. I, we don't have data to, to, to affirm that. And also a, a lot of parking spaces were removed from downtown during construction time and they weren't replaced. So it's harder to reach downtown nowadays with, by car. And, and what was the next question? Yeah, the next question was actually about parking, um, about the resistance of the developers to removing uh, parking or uh, parking minimums. You mean off-street parking? Um, I think it could be both, yes, off-street and on-street. Well, I, as I mentioned before, parking is always hard. It's always an issue, but it, it's like there is this, I don't think, this, we, we believe that parking is right, right? Right, right. So, for developers, we, we managed in, 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 in Sao Paulo to change the regulations and here in Rio as well, during the along corridors, 
along transit corridors, but I don't have the exactly number minimum requirements in or maximum requirement requirements in 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 my head right now. So I would suggest we if you want more information on Brazilian experience, I can put in touch with a colleague that manages that. Great. Um, Penina, do you want to add something about parking? Yeah, so for me, I see parking as a lever. You know, we have to balance between provision. It's, just, it's, it's not necessarily so bad. Like, it's always good to provide some parking. But at the same time, for me, I look at the government. Is the government also generating revenue? Now I'm talking about on-street parking. So, for, for, you know, like what happens in Kenya, there's nothing, uh, most cities, uh, we don't have uh, proper parking management systems. And so what happens, like, uh, they will charge uh, a specific amount of money for the whole day, like a whole day. That doesn't matter whether you take 12 hours on the street, you will only pay maybe 100 shillings per day. And so for Nairobi, I think it's 200 shillings right now. For Kisumu, it's like 200, so 100 shillings. For other cities within the Nairobi metropolitan region, we live in big, as low as 60 shillings, uh, Kenyan shillings. And so what happens when the parking uh, fee is so low, uh, then it actually attracts more cars to come, uh, more people to bring their cars into the street. And you'll find that by lunchtime, there are already a lot of cases of double parking, there's a lot of congestion, just people moving around the city looking for a good parking space. And what that happens, they also contributes to the congestion that you're talking about. So cities need to invest in a better uh, and efficient parking management system. And by that, maybe they need to come up with a system of knowing where they're supposed to park. There need to be information on where available parking spaces so that you know if I'm driving, then I know whether there's space available how much the, it, the pricing need to be hourly. Like they need to know, like for example, I always say, instead of you saying uh, it's a hundred shillings the whole day, one shilling, one hundred shilling is approximately one US dollars. So instead of charging that, then you can say per hour, you can charge maybe 20 shillings, you know? So to the public, it's going to look like the parking fee has actually gone down, but then it's hourly. So if you park your car for say eight hours a day, then you'll end up paying 160 shillings as opposed to parking like uh, 100 shillings flat rate. That way the city is able to get more money. And also because as private, uh, private car users will feel, okay, the pinch of paying hourly, then they're not going to park there for long. What happens is it's going to be high turnover, uh, high parking turnover. So the city gets a lot of money that can now be invested in NMT development, for example. At the same time, it discourages more people from, um, from parking on the street. And now also, so there need to be a proper ma uh, parking management system in, for cities. I think that's something that we're working on in some cities in uh, Kenya, uh, starting with Kisumu and even Nairobi. And now going to off-street parking, how people perceive. Well, there's some sort of demand and that demand is not like it's based on data. It's a perception by real estate developers that they need to provide more parking. And so what, they, what happens is that they, they will maybe provide a lot of basement uh, or like build an extra tower for, you know, for parking. But now what happens, the cost of housing becomes expensive. So there's, so it becomes unaffordable, you know, and that's when you see a lot of vacant uh, commercial spaces in some of those modern buildings that have over provided parking. But the developer is just trying to take back his money, you know, to re to access the money that you know we invest in parking. So basically we need a proper management system for both off-street and on-street. Thank you. Thank you so much for this um, elaborate answer. So we have many, many more questions, but unfortunately we are out of time uh, for today's session. We have gathered all questions though. Thank you, thank you again to the presenters and thank you of course to our attendees for joining us today. Um, as mentioned earlier, the webinar recording and the PowerPoint as well will be available on, on ITDP's website. In the meantime, please visit itdp.org to check out the latest um, ITDP resources and the Transport Matters uh, blog post series. And of course, check out our social media to stay in the loop for the next um, event with us. Thank you so much again for joining and thank you all three of you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Take care.